Well, would you look at that, I started the One Piece of JRPGs. Not because it's about pirates, although the game does have them, or you're looking for treasure some old kook hid away. It's because, like One Piece, it's a lifestyle, a commitment. The Kiseki series, which clocks in at 13 games, albeit two of them are Japan exclusive and 14 if you want to count Kai no Kiseki, that's coming out this year as of right now. I'm sure the director of this series has a billion more planned. Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky is a game a bajillion of you asked for, wouldn't stop bringing it up. And all it took was me getting a Steam Deck for my birthday and the homies gifting me these games. So harass and you shall receive a first timer's look at Trails in the Sky first and second chapter. I decided to group them up because essentially chapter 2, while it is another game, plays more like a disc 2, picking up right after the events of the first chapter, which by the way, ends on a massive cliffhanger while also feeling like an ending. So for that reason I won't be speaking much on second chapter story as I would have to spoil what first chapter was building up to. But don't worry, there's some new gameplay mechanics and music to be discussed. A quick history lesson. The Legend of Heroes Trails in the Sky is actually the sixth game of the Legend of Heroes game. These are not connected to the Trail series story, and at most they are left as loose references and callbacks. The first Legend of Heroes Trails game begins with Trails in the Sky first chapter, which is the recommended starting point and where my journey began. The beginning of this never-ending tale begins on a late night. A young girl, Estelle, is waiting for her father to come home. The hour is late when Cassius, the dad, returns with a gift for his beloved daughter. What do little girls want more than a whole-ass adopted brother? The boy, however, is in bad shape and is set to bed to rest. While Cassius is mindful of his condition, Estelle isn't. Being a spunky tomboy, she pesters the injured boy until he tells her his name. Joshua. So they meet at the tender age of 11 and immediately fast forward five years later. The two had grown up together. We come to find that their father Cassius is a member of the Bracer Guild, essentially a guild that helps people, whether it be exterminating monsters, investigating thievery, infiltrating government buildings, or searching for a relaxing cat in the sun. No job is too big or too small for the Bracer's Guild. Cassius isn't just a member of the Bracer's Guild, he's actually a high-ranking member, someone everyone praises, and yet he tends to downplay it all and keep it very close to the chest. Because of Cassius's work, Estelle and Joshua work to become bracers themselves. After passing, they become junior bracers, taking on smaller tasks. And in order to become full-fledged bracers, they must receive a letter of recommendation from each of the guild branches in each of the major territories of Liberal. While the siblings are hard at work, Cassius receives an urgent letter. It seems he's needed elsewhere as trouble is brewing. The world building is incredibly dense in Trails in the Sky, and I hear that this is the case for the series in general. The Bracers Guild and army don't always see eye to eye. The consistent mention of the 100 Day War, ancient civilizations, the Queen's birth, they and the looming might of the Erebonian Empire. There's so much to keep track of. Hell, there's even a newspaper, the Liberal News, to help keep you up to date with the latest in the country. I also like that it's more than just news, but traveling columns, book reviews, and more. The second game expands on these as tensions grow higher, additional organizations are revealed, and characters swapping affiliations. And just some context here, the first and second chapter take place in Liberal, and I want you to know, this is the entire world. So yeah, no wonder there's gonna be a bajillion games. While it is a tad overbearing, there's a lot of good stuff brewing. It's just sad that my old person's memory can't keep track of everything. But with the help of the Liberal News and the Bracers Handbook, I managed to do well enough. The Bracers Notebook is something you'll reference often in the game, and me in this review, as it keeps track of story thus far, recipes, quests, tutorials, and spells. But most importantly, the Bracers Notebook helped me remember what was going on, as I played a game in between first and second chapter. Cassius being summoned elsewhere, something goes awry and he's gone missing. Naturally, his children worry for him, but are encouraged to continue pursuing the path of Bracers while uncovering bits and pieces of what may have happened to him, but also learning about him, that he's a far greater man than his daughter realizes. And this is how the siblings travel around the world, meeting people from all over Liberal. That's right, on Estelle and Joshua's journey, they meet and leave behind several people. And I'm going to do this in reverse order, starting with all the supporting characters, saving our leads for last. So we got Zin, an eastern grizzly bear who towers over everyone and is a powerful monk and bracer. He likes himself a good drink and the ladies. Agate, my tsundere bracer boy. He's tough on the outside, but on the inside he's soft and cuddly. He gets flustered so easily, yet he's rough around the edges. Hands down one of my favorites. Love his story, even if it's one we've all heard before. 
Tita kind of pairs with Agate. She sort of fills the role of a little sister to him. And Estelle, for that matter. She's a sweet girl who wants to be a great mechanic just like her grandfather. She's brilliant with machinery and incredibly kind. And Agate just doesn't know how to handle that kindness, and it makes for great moments. Olivier, a flamboyant minstrel from Erebonia who appreciates the beauty in all he meets. He's flirtatious, fun, and always livens up the party. Definitely leans into the comic relief while also being an important member of the gang. He's up there with Agate for me. Every line of his just doesn't miss. Chloe, a young girl attending a prestigious academy who has a soft spot for children. Gonna be honest, she's probably my least favorite. The cast is colorful and she just pales in comparison. Think of her like Persona 4's Yukiko. Not bad, just bland. And Sherizard. Yes, that's how you say her name. Sounds like Charizard? I know, yes, applaud me for my totally original joke. Sherizard was under the mentorship of Cassius, and now she is Joshua and Estelle's mentor for becoming Bracers. I love her, she's a sadist cracking her whip at villainous individuals and always ready and willing to torture. She is certainly the ara ara lady of the group, and when she isn't whipping her lessers into shape, she's at the bar enjoying a drink or twelve. Exclusive to second chapter onward, we get Kevin, and we love Kevin. He's a man of the cloth who likey the ladies. He comes off as a greenhorn priest, traveling the world to help those in need while reclaiming artifacts for the church. And finally, the stars of the show, Estelle and Joshua. So an important thing to know about them is Joshua never tells Estelle his past, so she grew up knowing jack and shit about his former life. They have an agreement that Joshua will tell Estelle when he's ready, and she wouldn't ask about it. Honestly, I think that's super cute, respectful, and as the player, it made me want to know even more, as the time skip in the beginning mentions nothing of it. Just whatever happened to Joshua that night happened, and we just keep on keeping on. So his entire backstory is a mystery. While Estelle, we get an idea that she and her father have a healthy and loving relationship. They joke around, Cassius is unbothered by her sass, and even taught her how to use a boa staff. Estelle, I best describe as the heart. She's funny, a little ditzy, lovable, sassy, tomboyish girl. Now as a side note, can we talk about some of these characters' names? We have then Joshua. We have Agate, and then Kevin. When you read this name, what do you think? Oliver. But it's Olivier, because we fancy. What about this deceptively simple name? Walter, right? No, it's Walter. That W, it's actually two Vs, I guess. How do you think you say her name? Renee? No, it's Ren, stupid. Oh, are you curious how you pronounce this? Did you say Patermater like an idiot? It's Pottermater, obviously. Seriously, read a fucking book. <laughs> like, I love these characters, but God, their names are just all over the place. Anyways, I want to give Estelle a lot of credit because I fell for her as a character. I felt myself in her shoes in regarding how she was feeling, acting, speaking. She accomplished something magical for me personally. How you're supposed to feel with silent protagonists, like you're immersed, your actions are your own, you're communicating with the team, you're part of the adventure. Most emotions Estelle felt, I felt. Hell, I felt them before I tapped the button to continue the dialogue, and it just was like what I was thinking. How I was feeling was the next piece of dialogue. If I was thinking something sassy, Estelle was there. When shit hit the ceiling and we were hit with failure, I too was cursing and wished we could have shut the case. It actually was alarming with how in sync I was with Estelle. Now that I've gushed about how much I relate to Estelle, let me tell you a big reason why I don't. So Japan. Japan has a thing. Japan really likes their siblings. A lot. The amount of animes with the sibling lover trope is alarming. But to be fair, I think on a lot of American sites, there are a lot of step bro, step daughter shit too. And frankly, the whole sexualizing words like daddy, <laughs> poppy, mommy has become more prevalent in modern day lingo. But in any case, if you haven't guessed where I was going with this, yes, Estelle and her adopted brother Joshua are a thing. And listen, I was molded by anime, so incest, even if not blood related, doesn't phase me. Not my jam, but Oran High Host Club prepared me for this. Having a couple of good looking guys with homosexual tendencies earns the club high points. It also helps if the two struggle between their attraction and their friendship. And in our case, because we're twins, our relationship is taboo and therefore more intriguing. And this is where I really stick my neck out, but uh, I really like them together. Individually, Estelle and Joshua are great, but together, boy do they shine. I am a sucker for the mysterious and pragmatic character with a spunky, good-hearted person. It's a good trope, okay? Yeah, I could do without the stepbro cyst, but if you can overlook that and reframe it in your mind as childhood friends, it all checks out. 
It very much starts as brother and sister, then as the two eventually become closer and as they meet new people, they kind of put it in Estelle's mind like, oh, is he your boyfriend? Oh, is he your man? And their interactions begin to shift through the course of their adventure. And as a side note, this worries me because in second chapter, the brother-sister relationship between Agate, 24, Tita, 12, is very gently teased. Something that's genuinely supposed to be sweet is being teased as a future possibility and I'm like, guys, guys, I just want one wholesome brother-sister pairing, please. Aside from that, uh, familial loving, the Trail series has an excellent cast. There are no bad characters, only okay to great ones. The dialogue was fun, I loved having back and forths with NPCs, and you know, in second chapter, that is taken to the next level depending on who you have in your party. In first chapter, people come and go, and in the second chapter, you collect the whole gang who stays with you for the greater part of the game. So, with a bunch of characters at your disposal speaking to NPCs or doing certain quests with specific characters in your party, you get a little extra dialogue. This is especially true in Endgame of Second Chapter. It makes a world of difference in some cases. It's pretty obvious who you're supposed to bring, and if you don't, gosh, you are going to feel so incredibly unsatisfied and gypped. And you know, main characters aren't the only ones giving characterization. NPCs are rather fleshed out folks themselves. NPCs have unique personalities, history, families, friends, relations to other NPCs, making the world feel alive. NPCs don't spit standard dialogue. Hello, welcome to our shop, lovely day, isn't it? No, Estelle and company will have pleasant back and forth, and after most story beats, we'll have different dialogue. So, what does this mean? It meant for Xseed team 14 hour workdays and six days a week for nearly a year. And sadly, the result of their hard work had gone unrecognized by most as nobody bought Trails in the Sky first chapter via PSP when it was initially localized and released. Naturally, Xseed and Falcom were devastated and demoralized, which led to heavy debate if bringing over second chapter was even worth it. Not to mention, second chapter is twice as long as the first. Thankfully, a small translation studio, Carpe Fulger, offered to aid Exceed in any upcoming localization projects, and boy oh boy were they in for a surprise when they were handed over second chapter. It was a mess. From 50% of the completed work being in the wrong file format, to item names, descriptions, and spells not following the same ones from the first game, which meant hundreds of inconsistencies. It was a crazy time, and the entire squad had to crank things up to the max, but eventually, they got the game out. Remaining errors be damned, second chapter finally made its way to the western shore in 2007. For the full stories of horrors of translating trails of second chapter, check out Mac McMuscle's video. Shout out to him for letting me use him as a source. Now with how impressive the characters are and how expansive the world is, Let's see what makes it tick. Both Trails first and second chapter play almost identically, with second chapter adding a few more bells and whistles. It's a turn-based game with light tactical elements sprinkled in. It's formerly known as action time battles. They take place on a grid and at the left side, you can see your turn order via AT bar or action time bar. When it's your turn, you could attack, cast spells, use a craft, use an item, while seeing what's in your range. The attack option moves your character to a position where they can attack from. The downside here is you cannot manually move then attack like enemies can. You must spend one turn moving, then one turn attacking. Why this matters is some enemies have attacks that hit a certain direction or radius. You damn well know that you can't attack the enemy without being in range of an oncoming attack. If you automatically attack, the game positions you in a way that will get you as close as possible to the enemy for your attack to go off, which often means directly in front of them. I wish I could position my own damn self. I mean, the enemies get to. Now that I think about it, this is one of the few games where enemies get to do something that I can't. Rude. Fun fact though, rather than hitting attack when you're out of range, just move to get closer. It's actually better to select move and manually move yourself. Why? Because if you hit attack, despite not attacking, the game registers it as an attack and pushes you further down the AT bar. Whereas if you move, it's sometimes more directly dependent on the last action you did, how much delay that gave you on your previous turn, and the speed stat of the character in question. Arts are your spells and require energy points, or EP. Spells do not go off right away. They require an additional turn, depending on your casting speed stat. Another benefit to using spells and crafts are honing in on elemental weaknesses. And speaking on crafts, think of crafts as instant character unique moves. Crafts are used by consuming craft points, or CP. CP is gained by dealing and taking damage. Crafts are great for dishing damage, buffing, and healing in a pinch. When the CP bar hits 100, you can perform your S craft, a special craft which is this game's limit break, if you will, where they pop off dishing heavy damage or aid the party, but at the cost of all CP. But 
What if I told you the bar could surpass 100? Let's go for 200, baby, which makes the move even stronger. Sadly, there are no visual cues to dictate the difference, but those numbers sure do look larger. And this brings me to S break and playing with turn order. Did you notice to the right side of the AT bar, there are sometimes icons beside your character's icons? These indicate turn buffs and who will get them. For example, you'll see a yellow heart. This indicates restored health. A sword with an up arrow is a physical multiplier. An exclamation mark is a guaranteed critical. This is where the strategy bit really kicks in. It's trying to manipulate the AT bar's order so that you may snatch all the buffs for yourself or at the very least, prevent your enemies from getting them. Various actions manipulate turn order. As I said before, some spells go off quicker than others. Lesser spells seem to be back to back, meaning you can snatch up an upcoming buff, even if the spell isn't particularly useful. This is great because it gives purpose to lesser spells. There are crafts that knock back enemy turns, or some that move allies forward. And if you're truly in a bind, there are glorious S breaks, meaning you could take a turn immediately at the cost of all CP and making that character's turn come later. What I'm saying is if you can't manipulate the order beforehand, as long as you have at least 100 of your CP gauge filled, you can break through the enemy's turn on the spot, essentially stealing the buff that came with their turn. Pro tip, you do not ever want enemies, specifically bosses, to have an exclamation mark. They will kill you. Oftentimes, this puts the player in quite the conundrum. Sometimes I've had my CP gauge at 170 something, while I was aiming to reach 200. I just had to make a call on letting an enemy get a valuable bonus or depleting all CP just to steal it from them. I'm not a huge strategy game lover, but this was just the right amount of thoughtfulness I needed my turn-based RPGs. Not the boring standard attack, attack, heal, repeat shtick, or the overly complex elemental burst bits of Xenoblade 2. However, there was something that gave me a bit of a struggle building your character through orb mints. Orb mints are this world's tool that allows people to wield magic and enhances their natural capabilities. So first things first, Sepith. These are dropped by monsters or gained in treasure, which can be sold or used to make quartz. Every quartz corresponds to an element, fire, water, earth, wind, etc. Fire increases attack, lowers defense, and allows for fire arts. Water typically increases HP, raises magic stat, but lowers magic defense, and provides healing arts or offensive water magic. Some quartz grant certain ailment imbued effects. So most elements enhance a stat while bringing down another and are associated with certain spell types. In other words, this is how you build your character. You have an obvious fighter, load them up with fire quartz and dark quartz to act quicker. As you progress the game, you'll have access to stronger versions of quartz, court one, two, three, etc. Think of this as a more advanced Suikoden. Pending on the runes you have is what abilities you have access to, but also affecting your stats. And it doesn't just end there. Certain characters obviously fit into a spellcaster role, shown by how many lines they have on their orbment. I made the mistake of placing quartz wherever, and that couldn't be a bigger mistake. You see, every quartz has elemental value. On a single line, if you can get X amount of value from various slotted quartz in specific slots, you will gain specific spells. So for example, if you want the skill Stone Impact, you'll need an Earth quartz with a minimum elemental value of three, and a Space quartz with a minimal elemental value of two on the same line. If they're not on the same line, you're not going to unlock the spell you're trying to gain access to. And some quartz slots are fixed, which means only a certain type of elemental quartz can be installed there. This whole system helps further differentiate physical damage dealers from the magic users. A heavy hitter like Agate has three lines, making it difficult to cast intricate spells like Saint that need various chords, while Olivier has one line and is my spellcasting king. And remember those pesky translation errors? Well, they reared their ugly head in my gameplay. For example, I was trying to get a healing spell, checked the bracer notebook, and it said I needed this specific value to create the spell. And I did that, and it didn't unlock the spell I was owed. But then when looking on wiki, it said it I needed a wind quartz, something the in-game guide failed to mention. While my heart does go out to the translation team, I'd be lying if I said it didn't impact my gaming experience. Trying to understand the court customization was a little tricky, so the errors didn't assist in my understanding of what I was doing right and what I was doing wrong. I've grown to appreciate the line system because it makes you choose between focusing only on stats or caring less about stats and picking courts based on the arts you gain from them. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. Not everyone can be and do everything, so it really made you work to create your A-team. Now in second chapter, there's a few new additions. New orbments, meaning your old courts no longer work, aka resetting your build, typical of a new game, but the newer model allows for newer courts. 
Before, you could only go up to level 3, now you can go up to level 5. And secondly, something I didn't use a lot, but you know, it's cool, is chaining crafts, aka team-based attacks. A type of craft that allows several characters to attack simultaneously. A minimum level of CP is required, and the more characters that participate, the more CP it costs to join. I think a common complaint I hear about JRPGs is how easy they are nowadays. Well, let me tell you, Trails isn't hard per se, but my god, it ain't no pushover. This is the level of challenge I enjoy in all my JRPGs. And not to mention bosses? Yo, bosses are great, especially the ones that have buildup. They were challenging, throwing skills I've never seen any other enemies use, and are really great at throwing wrenches in my plans. They did a great job keeping me on my toes. I think it's easy to skirt by a lot of RPG bosses, but in Trails, you want to be prepared. You want to have items that cure status effects, restore mana, and enter battles with as much CP as possible. One boss in particular? Man, what a challenge. Fun fact, if you lose to this boss, you're given an additional option from retry and title screen. Instead, you get to continue as if you beat the boss, because the game knows how hard this specific fight was. Your girl lost like three times, because this fight was no joke. But man, it's so rewarding if you beat it. It feels amazing. My pits were sweating. However, I'm sad to report on Steam Deck if you hit continue, it assumes you're retrying. For whatever reason, what I mentioned before doesn't work, but you know, that's okay. I didn't need to. I won. Also, you'll be happy to hear there is little need for grinding. Any characters that are behind will quickly catch up within a few standard fights, and if you do try to grind, well, you'll be getting dinky EXP. Not worth the time unless you're grinding for Sepith. As long as you fight everything as it appears on screen, you'll be ready. And I can almost assure you, if you're stuck, it's not your level that's holding you back, it's your build. Outside of combat, there are things to do. You are a bracer after all, which means helping those in need. You'll do so via the quest board, which is where you get your side quests. Side quests are timed in relation to progressing the main story, so keep a close watch. These primarily consist of fighting a special enemies, collecting X thing, and in second chapter, you'll be hit with these annoying goose chase ones, where you have to examine different areas of a town to reclaim stolen objects. Hate it. Thankfully, it's an old game, spoiler-free guides are readily available. Also, I appreciate the monetary bonus if you complete certain quests flawlessly. Let's say saying a specific thing to an NPC, or not getting into any encounters during escort missions. And some of the side quests are more involved, giving fun moments with NPCs. Those ones are great, give me more of those. But my problem with Trails first and second chapter are, it's very filler. How the formula works is you go to one town, do story stuff, but not too much or else you might miss one of the time side quests. The story quests are great and left me ready to continue, but the thing with Trails is monsters don't give you any Mira, aka money. They drop only Sepith, materials used to enhance your orbments and create quartz. And while you can sell Sepith, the best and fastest way to earn Mira is to do side quests. Why do you need Mira? For equipment, of course, as it's scarcely found in dungeons, and it ain't cheap. So it's either struggle with damage and numbers or buckle up and do some busy work. I will say second chapter feels leaner with side quests, and especially towards end game, side quests severely dwindle because it's approaching the grand finale, which is appreciated. I think something else that put a major damper on my time with the first and second chapter is playing them so close together. It's a double-edged sword, right? Considering second chapter is literally like putting disc two in. You don't want to play them too far apart, otherwise you'll forget a lot, and first chapter ends on a massive cliffhanger. But imagine going to the exact same locations following the exact same formula. It was redundant. I was excited to get back into it, but was less enthused knowing I have a mountain of side quests to climb. Overall, I think the pacing hands down is Trails' largest shortcoming and puts the biggest damper on my experience. The look of Trails is... I don't know how to describe it. They look like figurines, little toys. I mean, look at them, they're all cute. They got little Bomberman eyes and they're all geared up. I'm gonna be honest, I don't really know what to add here. It certainly takes some getting used to, but like ultimately grew on me. In combat, they're a little more detailed. Like guys, it just speaks for itself. It's cute, gives me like claymation vibes, but less mation and more clay. Hopefully you know what I'm trying to say. I do like some of the battle S-Craft moments. Certain moves just have so much flair to them and I love it. It speaks to the character's personality, like Charizard and the classic oh ho ho laughter before she beats your ass in shape with her whip. Or Olivier's Requiem of Hearts. This man strums his loot, throws a rose into the air, and his loot becomes a fucking Gatling gun. Take that! And this may
I think what I really want to talk about is less the graphics and more the art and what a journey that was. So originally Trails in the Sky came out on PC in 2004 and this was the key art. We got this gorgeous 90s, early 2000s piece. It was simple yet beautiful, conveying our main protagonist with an ornament behind them. It's bright, cheery, my girl's so happy. The picture brings joy to all who gaze upon it. The portraits, however, don't follow that style. Sadly, in fact, mini tangent, I'm not a fan of the art. You know what it is? It's generic. If it weren't for you all badgering me to play this game, I would have never picked it up. It looks like some generic weeboo ass game. The portraits, while they show expression when you see the character art, it looks so... Uh, blanket. It kills me. It has no real character. Art is such a huge component of a game. There are several iconic titles that cause players to pause and appreciate the unique artistry, something that they can only see if they play X game. When I look at Trails art, it's disappointing in comparison. Characters look stiff and don't warrant a second glance, and that's so sad because these characters are awesome, and I want them portrayed in their full glory. So then, in 2012, Japan got an HD PS3 port with new art, and while beautiful, vastly different, is it weird that it gives me like fan art energy? Just because it's such a vast departure from this beautiful 90s style? Granted, it was only the box art, so it's not a big deal. Plus, I understand in the mid-2000s we were moving away from the Sailor Moon, Tachi Muyo art styles. But then, in 2015, Trails in the Sky First Chapter Evolution was released on the Vita as a remaster and they updated the art again, pushing for that modern art style, trying to keep up with the times. And we got this Moe piece. Okay, listen, I don't actually hate it, but again, we go back to generic. And what's interesting about this version is the portrait art actually matches the new Moe style. It's even slightly animated. All right, so it isn't terrible, but it does still lack identity. It's very strange because the trails art seems to evolve with the times rather than having its own distinct style. I don't know, maybe that's what they're going for. Generic is the style. But hey, from what I gather, trails of fans don't care, so neither do the developers. To wrap up this section, I need to warn PC players, specifically Steam Deck players, that CGI cutscenes or anime cutscenes don't work on the Steam Deck. We're hit with this weird screen right here. And to be fair, you do get a warning that all the Trails in the Sky games are not optimized for the Steam Deck. And warning taken, but it really did put a damper on my experience with this game. But also the mood was sullied, because oftentimes these cutscenes were played when it was trying to show something grand, something big. So to like stop the action, to go find the action, ugh. not a fault of the game, but it still sucked. Now, I know I just finished ripping the art style a new one, but the music blew me away. I'm starting to wonder if Falcom's music ever misses? I've only played a handful of Falcom games, but each one is great in the musical department. Trails in the Sky first chapter does not disappoint. I think the first thing I noticed was how homey it feels. You visit five towns and each town theme feels pleasant. Like you're happy to be there and you're happy to stay there. I can't think of a game where each town I visited just felt so welcoming. And in second chapter, you do a hell of a lot of backtracking, and hearing all the town themes again somehow feels nostalgic. Even though I play these games within months of each other, the music still hit like it was a song from my childhood. It was like saying, welcome back to liberal, and I was glad to be back. Here's just a sample of some heartwarming tunes. And the battle themes are fantastic too. They're fun and jazzy. Of course, we got standard fights, boss themes, and one of my favorite things is when things are looking troublesome, the music changes to something worrisome. A musical cue telling you to get your act together or else you're gonna be in deep doo-doo.
second chapter also added new music and the battle themes being one of them. And don't think Trails in the Sky's music is limited to battle and town themes. The in-between roads, forest, and late night conversations are all great. Honestly, I have so many favorites that it's borderline unfair to pick one. I could go the cliche route and say everyone's rightfully deserved favorite being Silver Will, or the final dungeon theme of first chapter, oh, so good. But I think I'll go with a secret green passage, which you guessed it, it's a path with a lot of greenery. I find myself a fan of the Trail series, however, you won't catch me being a super fanatic about it yet. My opinion of the Trail series thus far is, it's good. And if it could fix its pacing issues, it'd be great. The characters are so fun, and the parts I'm most looking forward to in the future entries is meeting more. I don't care if they're tropey, in fact, I'm tired of tropes getting a bad rap. Enemies to lovers, traitors, the comedic villain, these keep coming back because people eat this shit up. And yes, I'm people. Listen, a trope wouldn't have became a trope if it wasn't received well. And the music cannot be understated. If you're a fan of long form storytelling and massive amounts of world building that over time will challenge both your memory and attention to detail, then this is it. Your journey starts here. So I hope you all are happy now. I'm one of you guys, sort of. I plan to casually make my way through the series and hopefully falling in love with each new entry. And as you're watching this, know the third Trails in the Sky game has already been beaten and the review on it is currently in production. But now that I've begun this journey, it feels like every Trails related thing is a spoiler. I feel like I've always seen these characters, but now that I have context, I'm like, oh my God, this character and they're all grown up. Ah! Or oh my God, this character survived this thing. Look away, you know? <laughs> so beware when you start this series, if you're anything like me, I blocked Falcom. I said, don't recommend me these trails oriented youtubers so i'll probably not read the comments on this video i tend to tiptoe around trails conversations if not excuse myself entirely hell i'm trying not even look at boxer all i know is there's a guy who has black hair to white hair and that that's it that's all i got <laughs> i'm like no that's too much when getting pictures for this video music for this video i asked my friends to send me links so that way i can just download them without you know messing up my youtube algorithm telling them i want to see more trails content like i'm trying to cover all my bases and as I was doing research for this video, I know I saw things that I shouldn't have seen yet. <laughs> Whoops. It's a struggle out here to avert my eyes from everything, but you know, we'll get her done slowly but surely. And I hope you guys enjoy my journey through this new series. Thank you all so much for watching. For more JRPG goodness, check out my videos on Suikoden and its criminally underrated sister, Alliance Alive. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to support what I do on Patreon. And until then, Mwah!